um, which it return, returns us back to Pangraph actually. Um, and Liam, um, Liam Shaw is going to be talking to us about using Pangraph to explore plasmid diversity. Liam, you've had a warm up act. Um, I yes. would not describe Marco as my warm up act. Um, that makes it sound like I'm <laughs> the, the headliner. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, using Pangraph practically. So I've been visiting um, the group here who developed Pangraph, um, and I'm very much a user, not a developer. So if I can use it, you can too. Um, so I'll be kind of just talking about some of the explorations I've been doing of plasmids using this very useful tool. Um, to start with, I thought I'd start by mentioning Ulysses, um, which I think has a lot of similarities with plasmid diversity in that it's vast, extraordinarily diverse, and understanding it may seem like uh, it's a fool's errand, but also because the last line of Ulysses, um, for anyone who's read it, uh, is Trieste, Zurich, Paris, and this conference was meant to be in Trieste, of course, um, sadly. We're online. Uh, but throughout the talk, I'll put Ulysses quotes in the top left. Uh, so if you're really bored with plasmids by this point, just look there and there will be something that is relevant from Ulysses because really Ulysses has everything in it. So I'm going to talk about why Pangraph is a useful tool for exploring plasmids and then give two examples. I'll spend most of my time on the first example of antimicrobial resistance plasmids and then I'll talk about the idea of plasmid architectures in the second example. So why should we think that Pangraph is going to be useful to explore plasmids? Now, tools exist to cluster plasmid diversity and Fernando's talk earlier was a fantastic example of this. So um, Coppler, the classifier that his group have been developing is extremely useful. Um, and you have a different range of uh, ways of clustering plasmid diversity. So there's traditional typing schemes, which are based on presence, absence, or sequence type of a, a set of known genes. You have alignment free, free clustering, which is based on the similarity of component kamers, um, so not actually aligning things. And then you have alignment based clustering based on something like average nucleotide identity. And you have some rules for partitioning up the big messy network that you get into clusters. However, once you have those clusters, um, understanding the structure within them of what happens to the plasmid evolution within the clusters is more difficult. Um, those clusters are a fantastic place to start. So this isn't a criticism of those methods. It's just that we have the clusters. Now we've got to explore them. And plasmids are actually a special case of pan genomes. So uh, in James's talk, he talked about how you've got a core genome, which is the genes that all strains uh, share, and then the accessory genome, which is genes unique to particular strains or not seen in all members of a species. And with plasmids, you kind of have a similar thing. You have the core genome might be a backbone plasmid, and that backbone plasmid is found within other plasmids that you might call compound plasmids, as this pre recent preprint does. And vari variations on a definition of backbone plasmid could be given. But if we think of it as a minimal entity that can propagate using the genes that are on that backbone, then in plasmid pan genomes, we kind of have a minimum working example approach to pan genomics because the core genome can actually exist on its own. Um, and plasmids are interesting to think of in a pangenome approach because they're tractable. You can sort of make the visualizations and also do the quantitative stuff. Whereas with whole genomes, looking at the big messy graphs that you get, um, it's just more difficult to work out what's going on. So I think starting with plasmids is a good idea when trying to build models of pangenome evolution, even though they are a bit of a special case. So to start with, um, I'll give this example of antimicrobial resistance plasmids and why Pangraph is useful to look at this type of evolution. So Zam mentioned uh, this paper, um, which uh, involved a hospital outbreak in, the, in a hospital in America over five years 
multiple species, multiple plasmids, genetic elements moving this gene around. It's a nightmare and it's a really fantastic paper. And I really recommend if you haven't read it, do so because you'll learn a huge amount. And I, I think that's kind of a, a real, that was a groundbreaking paper in exploration of this genetic diversity in bacterial genomes. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, suffices to note that plasmid structures can be extremely dynamic. So here I'm taking out a tiny section of that data set to explore. So they did long read sequencing on a subset of isolates at the time, I think 17, which you know was uh, expensive. And so they only did it on a small subset, but um, you get the whole plasmid assembly uh, for those for those reduced set of plasmids and i'm picking out four plasmids that were uh so here's a here's a reference plasmid that was also sequenced as part of this collection of isolates and it's a 43 kilobase pair plasmid that carries on it this resistance gene and here are four other plasmids that were isolated within a two-year period from different species and Compared to the reference, uh, these two plasmids, P1 and P2, I've simplified the names from the original publication. They had one single nucleotide variant in the reference sequence. The others had zero changes. But then the structural changes were much larger. And again, this is a table from the original paper. So P1 had no changes with respect to this reference. P2 had a 188 base pair deletion. P3 had an insertion. And P4 had a duplication of this uh, blar KPC containing region and then an insertion as well. That's how they characterized it in the paper. That's what I've taken that description from. So if we look at this with aligning genes, for example, or trying to visualize it, that's a very common approach to take to look at gene diagrams. This can be quite confusing. So to make this, I've found genes in the plasmids with prodigal and annotated them with Procker. Um, so Procker will actually run prodigal as part of it. Um, and then produce this visualization with Clinker. There are many other methods you could have used. Um, or, uh, but this is just to point out that some of the things show up quite nicely. So for example, here's an insertion, it looks like. So this is the, uh, this would be how they worked out that there was a 1,200 base pair insertion in P3 compared to this reference sequence. Um, but the duplication that's going on uh, between P4 and the other ones is kind of all the way off down here. I've truncated it because it's, it's, it's too big. And this is not really quantitative. This is a way of qualitatively looking at the data and trying to work out what's going on. But it would be nice to have a data structure that uh, was based on alignment of blocks of uh, homologous sequence, which is what PanGraph is. So here's the commands that I ran on this set of plasmids. And this is what you get. So if you visualize the results of running those commands on these plasmids in Bandage, um, a program made by Ryan Wick, originally for looking at assembly graphs, but it works equally well here for looking at pangenome graphs, um, you have these sets of blocks. And Here's the KPC gene, which is on one of these blocks. So remember from Marco's talk, um, this is all of the, this is a representation of all of the genomes together, how blocks are connected. Any particular plasmid genome will be a walk through this graph. So a closed loop that goes around uh, the graph. So uh, for example, um, we have uh, plasmid one, the reference and here I'm showing sort of linear version of the alignment blocks that PanGraph has discovered um, in these plasmids. So if we take plasmid one, let's start at the purple. So we're gonna go purple, red, orange, yellow, green. And then we're back where we started. So that's the circle. If we take plasmid four, for example, uh, we're gonna go purple, red, orange, yellow, green. Then we've got this, kind of similar yellow color. We go all the way around that loop. Then we go orange, yellow, green again, and we're then back where we started. That's the end of the plasmid. So why is this good? Well, it, that data structure allows us very easily to compute 
structural distances. And what do I mean by that? Well, this is very much a toy example. So um, I'm just going to go through it. If we imagine we have the reference plasmid and plasmid two, say, which had a deletion, we look for the longest common subsequence of blocks um, between those two. You'll see that it's purple, red, orange, green. So we just go through and it takes into account both the presence and the order of the blocks. So there's a break point here is what we say, because there's a difference between these two plasmids at that position. If we take, for example, plasmid four, um, the longest common subsequence here is purple, red, orange, yellow, green. They both have yellow block in this case. The break point actually comes at the end. And this whole thing is a single break point because it comes between the green and going back to the beginning, the purple. So that's the same number of break points as the previous example, even though there's a vastly different amount of sequence uh, that's been changed in those different cases. So we could choose to weight those differently. And that's something I'll be very interested in people's thoughts on. But for the purposes of this, I'm just going to treat those as the same. So we can have a distance matrix between the plasmids now based on breakpoints. And because this is a very simple example, but it is a real example, um, it turns out that between plasmid one and all of the other plasmids, there's one breakpoint. Um, and for example, if we compare plasmid two and plasmid three, we see that there's two breakpoints. Plasmid three has a bit of blue here and uh, plasmid three also has a bit of yellow. So this is the thing that's a deletion in plasmid two compared to the others. And that is, so that's two breakpoints and it ha we have a two in the distance matrix here. So we've got evolution going on. We can use different distances to characterize that evolution. And those distances have different information um, that they're gonna contain. So if we use a reference-based mapping, the single nucleotide variance against the sequence of the reference plasmid, we will see this tree. So plasmid one and plasmid two have one position where they vary over that 43 kilobases. And plasmid three and plasmid four are the same as the reference. So I'm just showing this tree like this, but I could put them on top of the reference here. This is, this is, that would be the same tree structure. If we use KMAS, so if we ask about the presence or absence of KMAS, not taking into account um, like alignment or anything, we're gonna get that P1 is the same as the reference. P2 is a little bit different because it's got this deletion. P3 is a bit more different because it's got a slightly larger insertion. And P4 is really different to everything else because it's got this massive insertion. So that's quite a different picture of the evolution. If we were using this to infer stuff about evolution, it's quite a different picture. And now here we're using blocks and the breakpoint distance. Um, so P1 is the same as the reference. All of the other things have one break point uh, with respect to P1 and two with respect to each other. So to go from P2 to P3 is one, two. Um, so this is, this is not a phylogeny, right? It's a tree representation of the distance matrix. And this is sort of very easy to get out of PanGraph. We get really easy access to data on the plasmid structure. But what we need is evolutionary models to link those distances to evolution and find minimum parsimony routes. So for example, uh, just thinking about plasmid four where the paper says it's a duplication and an insertion, we might want to sort of decouple this one break point into two different things, but we need a model of evolution to do that. So far, we're just saying every break point is the same. So uh, in the remaining time, I'm just gonna talk about uh, another application of PanGraph to different plasmid architectures. So there was a recent paper, uh, a preprint, um, or a recent version of a preprint, I should say, uh, on BioArchive um, from these authors, which is a really fascinating paper that I'd recommend everybody read. They searched in human gut metagenome assemblies for circularized plasmid structures. So they used read mapping patterns to decide whether a contig was uh, a plasmid or not, and uh, some plasmid classification stuff. They basically got a big data set of plasmids out of that, tens of thousands of plasmids, many of which 
have no similarity to reference plasmids. Then they group these plasmids into plasmid systems. They basically align, I won't go through all of the details, but they align the plasmids to each other using directed edges to represent containment. So this backbone plasmid is present in all of these compound plasmids. And then they call this connected component of the network a plasmids uh, system. And this is you, a better starting point for the purposes of pangraph than alignment-free clusters, where you can actually have uh, cases where the sequence divergence is greater than that tolerated by pangraph at the moment. So when you align the plasmids and make the graph, you'll get disconnected components. Um, which is yeah, sort of just a, a current limitation of the tool. So here's plasmid system one, which is the first of these over 1000 different plasmid systems that they report in this preprint. It's 26 plasmids recovered from a whole bunch of different gut beds genomes. They're between five and 15 kilobases long. They have a RETB, um, RETB gene there. I don't know why I've written protein, sorry. Uh, and then, there's no hits in PlasDB. There's no PTU assigned by Coppler because this is a metagenome plasmid. You know, you might want to treat it with some skepticism. Here is the pangraph representation of that, uh, those set of 26 plasmids. And I'm showing the core blocks in red and I've just given the blocks numbers so that they're a bit easier to, um, it, your colors wouldn't be informative here. So I've just used uh, numbers so that I can refer to them. And so if we imagine a particular plasmid that's not the backbone plasmid, so this core plasmid is, is you know, one, three, two, uh, another plasmid might be one minus seven, 10, three, 11, two. So one minus seven, 10, three, 11, two. And then I'm just, I've messed around with this to make that a bit more apparent that that's the walk through the graph. So if we plot the breakpoint distance uh, as a tree, of all of those different plasmids. And I've collapsed, uh, this is the most common plasmid sequence of blocks. Uh, so I, that's why that point is bigger than the others. I've just collapsed it to make the, the tree easier to understand. You can see that here's the backbone plasmid, the sequence of blocks one, three, two. Uh, and then for example, this plasmid has uh, one breakpoint where 510 has been inserted and you can see that there's a lot of conservation of block syntony. So one, three, two, this, this, what we're calling the backbone plasmid putatively appears in the same order in all of those different plasmids. So this is quite interesting because we very quickly get a picture of how syntony is working in the plasmid, how the architecture uh, might be going. So we could think like, why is this region disrupted? Why, why between three and two, there's only one disruption compared to many other disruptions in the other regions of the graph, for example. So we're already kind of, you can see there's lots of questions we can start to answer once we have this representation of the plasmids as this data structure the pan graph gives us. So, uh, there's future work to do. Obviously, I've just presented really rough work in progress um, using Pangraph, which it's a pleasure to use. So Pangraph is a scalable way to explore these clusters of plasma diversity, but what are the right metrics? Okay, so we Pangraph contains within it, not just the uh, graph of blocks, uh, of you know paths of blocks uh, that I've been talking about here, but it also does contain the alignments of those blocks. So you could combine the SNP level information with the structural information, and that would be very cool. And then there's these kind of two applications that I can think of. One is this recent structural evolution where antimicrobial resistance plasmid should represent an ideal test case to estimate those rates for various processes of structural change. So how common are duplications compared to deletions or something like this? And then also plasmid architectures. So we've got lots of clusters of plasmids. What are the possible topologies of graph structures that exist? How can we connect those to models of evolution? I think that's a really interesting question. So it remains for me just to thank very much uh, Richard for hosting me in his book for this visit, Nick for being the main developer of Pangraph, and Marco for also developing Pangraph and for uh, kind of helping me in how to use it. 
And I'd really welcome people to email me in particular, uh, if you know of longitudinal long read plasmid data sets, uh, it may be uh, ones that are yet to be published or so on. I'd be very interested in those. And also if you have thoughts about models of structural evolution um, that could be applied here, that would be fantastic. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Liam, that was an absolute tour de force. That was really brilliant. Um, I am going to, you've got two questions already. I'm going to skip Natasha's for the moment, if that's okay, Natasha, because I think Liam answered it in his talk. So I've got a question from Jana. Liam, very interesting and thought-provoking talk. Can you please say a bit more about the models describing Sintony evolution that you're considering or where or how could one, where would one start developing such a model? Yeah, okay, uh, yes, very good question. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it, but I think that's really something more for discussion. Um, so one of the representations of genomes that was popular a while ago, or that some people still work on, is this idea of assigned permutation. Um, so you have um, integers, say like one to 10, and those can have signs, they can be positive or negative. And then you assume that any genome contains no duplications and is some ordering of those things. So you can represent like your genomes as signed permutations of the numbers one to 10. And then you ask, okay, if I only allow reversals of any size, so you can take any sort of block of numbers and flip the sign of them uh, and turn them all around, uh, how can you go from one sign permutation to another? And that uh, there exist algorithms for, and that was kind of very interesting stuff on chromosome evolution, maybe like 20 plus years ago. Um, however, it gets very complicated once you allow things like transposition duplication so yeah, it's 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 an mp hard problem once you start adding those things in um so yeah that's one example of sort of a model that has been applied in the past to this kind of approach um but i don't know that there's one that is ideal at the moment okay that's a great answer thank you uh, I, don't, I don't think i've seen one that copes with um I mean, most of those are really set up for genomes that contain fundamentally the same genes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and once once you add super short, you know, so there are some models where people allow what are called super short um, transpositions or things like involving only you know two genes or blocks, um, because otherwise the combinatorial space just explodes. Yeah. Okay. Anything from anyone else? Okay, um, I'm sure people will want to talk to you more about this during the discussion, Liam. Um, I'm going to hand over now to the next speaker.